I want to approach this video by breaking it up into two small parts. In part one, I want to uh, discuss the issues facing the medieval and post-Reformation theologians as it related to God's sovereignty and libertarian free will. And then in part two, I want to look at how Molinism answers that issue. There is a tension that exists between God's sovereignty on one hand and humanity's libertarian free will on the other. Both doctrines are supported in Scripture. However, when we introduce the idea of God's omniscience into the discussion, there seems to be a contradiction between these two doctrines. Now, different theological systems have come about in order to explain this alleged contradiction. The problem that seems to arise out of this, though, is that one side will elevate their doctrine while downplaying the other doctrine, and the result of this is that both sides end up having to be very creative in their scriptural interpretation in order to maintain their position. For instance, Arminianism tends to place the emphasis on humanity's libertarian free will and downplays God's sovereignty. Calvinism, on the other hand, places the bulk of its emphasis on God's sovereignty and downplays libertarian free will. Now, each of these moves can end up having very severe uh, negative effects on the traditional view of the nature of God. For instance, moving too far into Arminianism can land someone in open theism, whereas moving too far into Calvinism can land someone in hyper-Calvinism. And both of these will do some sort of damage to the nature of God. Open theism damages God's omniscience. Hyper-Calvinism damages God's goodness. And this is where Molinism comes into the picture. Molinism could be understood as a mediating position between Calvinism and Arminianism. It seeks to reconcile the doctrine of God's sovereignty with the doctrine of libertarian free will, all while keeping God's omniscience faithfully and fully intact. But prior to Molinism, medieval theologians like Duns Scots and Thomas Aquinas were already familiar with the concept of God's middle knowledge. But in the late 16th century, the Spanish Jesuit priest, Luis de Molina, developed a theological system that would accept both God's sovereignty and libertarian free will, given the backdrop of God's omniscience, without there being a seeming contradiction. He accomplished this by proposing that there were three logical moments to God's omniscience. Now, I need to stress that these are logical moments and not chronological moments. Now, the first moment is called God's natural knowledge, and this encompasses everything that could happen. Now, as a way to help explain this, I'm going to quote directly from Ken Keithley's book, Salvation and Sovereignty. And this is an excellent book to get if you want to get an introduction to Molinism. So Ken Keithley writes, the, uh, writes this about the first moment of God's knowledge. His natural knowledge, his omniscience, encompasses all truth. There are two types of truth, necessary truths and contingent truths. Necessary truths are those propositions that are true by virtue of the nature of God himself. Contingent truths are those propositions that possibly could be true if God so chose to bring them into existence. God knows all the possible worlds he could create, and all possible individuals, and all possible circumstances in which they could be placed. God possesses this knowledge by virtue of his very nature, hence the label natural knowledge." Unquote. The second moment of God's omniscience is called God's middle knowledge. This is everything that would happen, something we would call feasible worlds. Going back to King Keithley's book, to quote him on this, he writes the following quote, God's middle knowledge is a subset of his natural knowledge. It contains the contingent truths of what every possible creature would do, not just could do, in any possible set of circumstances. This moment contains the counterfactual truths concerning the contingent choices of genuinely free creatures, so it is logically prior to God's creative decree and his subsequent free knowledge of what will happen. An important note to make at this point is that God does not perceive what free creatures could do or would do, but rather he conceives their choices within himself. 
That is, God does not look forward in time to ascertain what decisions we would make. Instead, he innately knows all free choices due to his omniscience. So God's middle knowledge contains the knowledge of the choices and decisions made by free creatures. But the source of that knowledge is not the creature. Rather, the source is God himself. Unquote. So after the second logical moment in God's omniscience, after God's middle knowledge, Molina says that this is where God creates. God, using his middle knowledge, actualizes this world. He decrees this world into existence. And then this gets us to the third moment of God's omniscience, according to Molina. This is what is known as God's free knowledge. This is everything that will happen in our actual world. Again, going back to King Keithley, he says, quote, God's knowledge of this world is based on his free, sovereign decision, which is why this third moment is called his free knowledge. Employing this three-moment model, Molinism fully affirms both divine sovereignty and human freedom. Molinists understand everything to occur either by God's will or by his permission. God directly wills and accomplishes all that is good by his grace, but permissively allows the evil that occurs." Unquote. So how do we see this idea of middle knowledge and counterfactuals taking place in Scripture? Well, there are many, many examples, both in the Old Testament and in the New, but I really only have time to give you one, since this video is already starting to get a little longer than I uh, would like it to be. So 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 10 to 13. I'm going to read through this, and then I'll, uh, afterwards I'll come back uh, with, with an explanation of how this is kind of uh, playing out here. Um, so it goes this way. Then David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard that Saul intends to come to Keilah and destroy the town because of me. Will the citizens of Keilah hand me over to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord answered, He will come down. Then David said, Will the citizens of Keilah hand me and my men over to Saul? They will, the Lord replied. So David and his men, numbering about 600, left Keilah at once and moved from place to place. And when it was reported to Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he called off the expedition. Okay, so let me unpack this real quick. Let's, let's talk about what's going on in this passage and how it illustrates uh, divine um, omniscience and this idea of middle knowledge and counterfactuals and free will and, and sovereignty. God knows in his omniscience everything that's going to happen. Now, David doesn't know it because David has limited knowledge, but David's dud has free choice. And so when David is up against the corner, he asks God, what's going to happen if I stay here at Keilah? Will the citizens of Keilah hand me over to Saul? And God says, yes, if you stay there, Saul will come and get you, and the citizens will hand you and your servants over to him. And so David, doing the smart thing, uses his free will and leaves and as a result, a different outcome occurs. Saul gets the report that David's no longer at Keilah, and he calls off the expedition, he calls off the chase. Now, God in his omniscience knows both outcomes. He knows that if David stays there, that the people of Keilah would hand him over to Saul. He also knows that if David leaves, that Saul will call off the chase. But God doesn't just know both outcomes. That's part of his middle knowledge. God knows all that could happen or that, that, that could happen. God also knows what will happen. That's his free knowledge. In his free knowledge, God knows that David isn't going to stay. God knows that David's going to ask him the questions. God knows that based on the answers that David gets from him, that David will, through his free choice, make the choice to leave Keilah and that Saul would stop pursuing him in this, uh, in, in this particular event. And that essentially is all we're talking about when we're talking about middle knowledge and counterfactuals, that, that God knows what you actually will choose based on his omniscience, but he also knows what other outcomes would happen if you, choo if you were to choose 
otherwise.